Boy, somebody chose some rallying songs this morning, didn't they? Wow. All right. And here I am, and I have to come up here and keep myself subdued. You know, I heard Matt's counsel. <clears throat> you have to start low, you know. You know, there's a saying about that in preaching. It says, start low, climb higher, strike fire, retire. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll try to do that. And you know, it's all by grace. For us to even have an unction to want to live our life for you, Lord. It is all by grace. And it can be lost. Not grace lost, but that focus can be lost by competing affections, competing things that come in. I want you to uh, do something with me this morning. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to do that, if you would. The uh, card. You got a three by five card? Three by five card? I'd like you to take your three by five card. Anybody need a three by five card? There you go. Need one up here. Right there, back there on the table. So, oh, by the way, in case you wonder what a three by five card looks like, I put one up here for you. So, on this three by five card, Hope you have something to write with. Okay, I'd like you to write one on that line or thereabouts, and then two down here a little bit lower, and then three on the line side of the card. So we're going to use this in a little bit. This lined, numbered, three by five card. We're going to use it after I tell you about a strange experience I've had. As a matter of fact, I've had it repeatedly. You've probably had one similar, or maybe more. I don't know. I had it more than once in one day. It happened that Lita and I were going to Muncie. We decided to do that just so we could have some time to talk and see each other, you know, how that kind of goes in life. So we were going to do that and, you know, get a bite of lunch. Or, and uh, we went to Rural King because that's my favorite place. No. But it is kind of a neat store, really, I think. Anyway, to get some salt and some other things for the water softener. By the way, Connie told me, where'd she go? There she is. She told me that that is the best place to buy it, Rural King. And she's right, so I buy it there. Consistent. Well, I was doing that, walking up by the salt, and there was this couple that said, Hi, how are you? We haven't seen you. And they started to talk to me and, and that kind of thing, and I didn't know who they were. And you know, I, when somebody does that because of, you know, some settings like the church I'm in, you know, and they, boy, that pastor's really stuck up, you know, because... So I usually am friendly back like I know them, you know what I mean? And so they kind of went, and Lita and I did some things around Muncie. We were on the way home. We stopped at the Shell Station in Royerton because they got good gas prices there, and we were getting the gas, and I got out of the car. I said, hey, how you doing? And some guy started to talk to me, and do you remember school? And he went on and talked about when we were in school. And he said, are you so-and-so? And I said, no. <laughs> Have you had that? People, I, I've been in Save a Lot downtown. And somebody comes up to me, hey, how you doing? Hey, I, I know this probably isn't the place for it, but I'd like to ask you a question. And he started to tell me about a custody case with his brother and the brother's son and what he should do about that. And you know, being... Pastor, you know, you don't, ah, uh, I think you better get some legal counsel on that. And, and then I, I think it was the same guy in Walmart who came up to me again and asked me, 
for legal counsel. I, I think it was, I don't know, because I don't know the guy. Yeah? Yeah, that must have been it. I think that was what he ended up saying. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And around town, I'm frequently asked medical questions. You, you want to know why? Um, you had that? Somebody starts inter. I, we just came back from Tennessee, and the story from, from Tennessee that there is these two guys that came up to the bus stop and hey, how you doing? They got to back slapping and hee haw and yuck yucking, and they carried on, and then they found out they didn't know each other. A strange thing. Uh, now for this card thing, you know, that we were talking about here. Uh, on, uh, on line one, I'd like you to write down who in, in your life is probably the person that you know the very best of all. That's on number one. And then the other two are people who you know really well. And I'd like you to jot them down here. People who in your life you probably know the very best of all. That's number one. I, I know this person and by the way, as you're putting this down, what is it that, that is involved in, in knowing somebody? What, what, what is that involved? I'm willing to take responses from the floor. On the good, bad, okay, experience. Experience. Okay, what they like, what they don't like. I don't, I, do you think he liked that? <laughs> yeah. He did. Oh, that's good. I couldn't tell. I don't know you, though. No, I do know. What else? Okay. So you know their characteristics. You kind of talked with them. You know their manners. Takes, takes time, doesn't it? Takes being around them. Communication, yeah, and that is increasingly interesting, isn't it? Communication. Because sometimes you think you got it, and you just don't have it, okay? Habits, takes that, takes that. Knowing a person. You know, knowing a person, Jesus said this, I know my sheep, and they know me. I'm the good shepherd. Being a shepherd, it takes getting to know people. You, you need to know them, how they are. At work, with the people you work with. If you've got an assistant, an associate, you need, to, you need to know. I have to know staff and the practitioners I work with. As a matter of fact, knowing people, do you know what the most popular major in college is? What is it? Psychology. Most popular. Because you get to know people. And of course, here is one of the top ten circulated magazines in the world. And why? because it's about people. And what are the top 10? And you know, there are some others that are takeoffs from it, like us and we and me. You ever notice, you notice anything about that? It's a people thing, but it's kind of a people thing that's about us, but even the ones like Time Magazine, I, I googled Time Magazine and all the covers, a tremendous number of covers showing people. And here, of course, is a photo of international renown of which National Geographic has several of people. And not only magazines, but there's also programs about people. And this was a sad note. That seemed entirely ironic. Did it? And of course, we have talk shows about people. And we won't even show any images of the tabloids because you've seen enough of them at checkout counter. 
globe and sun and star and whose other, other gossip notes. I think that's what the Bible calls that, isn't it? Gossip. People. People are amazingly interested. Jesus had a question. Pop to him. How do you know me? How do you know me? You know, people, people are interesting. What does it take? Well, this morning, as per Jesus, we're going to see what it is present and what it'll be in the future for him to know you. The question came in first or Gospel of John chapter 1, and I'd like you to turn there with me. Gospel of John chapter 1. John's Gospel chapter 1. And as you're going there, we are, as you know, in a series on people. The personalities that Jesus brought to himself to be with him so that they might know him and that he might send them out. That was his disciple making. Twelve. And we've talked about several. Hopefully you're hearing about them in your D-bands. Today we come to another one. John chapter 1. And this is the guy that popped the question to Jesus. How do you know me? Now, it happened like this. Jesus was being intro. John chapter 1, verse 29. Jesus has, or John rather, has just been questioned, interviewed by the Pharisees, the chief priests, the leaders of the time. In verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming and he intros him. Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 36, the day following that, day two, John again was standing there with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as Jesus walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Then day three, pick up with me at verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And we talked about Philip last week, and the calf paths of the mind, those things that we have become comfortable with, that we do fit us like, like an old pair of shoes, though they're crooked and broken down. And Jesus helped Philip with that by his follow me. As a matter of fact, that's what he said to him. Jesus found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip, verse 45, found Nathanael. And he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, remarks to him in verse 48. And Nathanael says this, how do you know me? How do you know me? We're going to talk about that. How do you know me? And Jesus' answer, in a nutshell, comes across like this. Interestedly. I know you. Very interestedly. He's going to demonstrate that to him. And he's going to communicate as what it is for Christ to know you now. And what it is to the future. That's what he gives to him here. He unfolds what it is for you to know Christ. Uh, better said for him to know you we're going to see this here this what is this by Leonardo da Vinci there's his last supper it's a famous 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 painting of course it has been updated and great and kind of refurbished in regards to the 
photos that come out from it. Let me give it this way. There it is with the disciples' names on it. Too bad I can't blow this up. That'd be better so you could see this. Right over here is Bartholomew, and right there is James Minor. This is Andrew. My voice got a little deep there. Did you notice that? This is Andrew. Here's Judas that you can't hardly see, and there's Peter. And, and can you see this? Can you see this right here, over, over there, right here? This is, still isn't very clear. I ought to just... This is John. That's, remember when I talked about John and how they see John, the fisherman, the son of thunder, and he's... He looks like a girl. As a matter of fact, Da Vinci Code, you know, you've heard about that, Da Vinci Code and this thing, that it was... Uh, okay. Anyway, going on, uh, there is Thaddeus, and there's James Major, that's the first martyr, there's Philip, and there's Matthew, and there's Thaddeus and Simon. So that was the breakdown. By the way, where's Nathaniel? Bartholomew. Oh, what do you, well, here, let me put this up here. This is a listing of all of the apostles as they're given out in the scriptures and by name. And did you notice something here? This is like one, two, three. He had three D bands of four people. That's what Christ had in this apostle group. He had three D bands, three disciple bands. The guy who was the head of the band is the first one listed and each one. And this is kind of extending order as to how close and tight they were with Jesus. As a matter of fact, in the first D-band, you notice these are the guys that he kept taking to the Mount of Olives and to the raising of the, of the, of the daughter of the child and all of that. And they, they saw this stuff. And by the way, if you wonder why we have D-bands here and why they're broken out the way they are with heads, and let me tell you, the D-band is in not on itself an end. It is not. The D-band is preliminary for exactly what Jesus said to be with so that you can be sent out. Sent out for what? To have a D-band. Now, I want you to know one of the tightest D-bands you'll ever have are those in your own family. Those are the ones that you are tightest to. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of family folks in this. Andrew, Simon Peter, brother, Simon Peter, were brothers, physical. And James and John, as a matter of fact, the first D-band were two sets of brothers. It's interesting. As a matter of fact, these folks, Philip, was from the same town as those folks because there's something in regards to knowing people that lends itself well to building disciples like Jesus told us to do. To be with him, to send out and make disciples. And he said, I'm with you always to do this. Amen? Discipling is about being with. Taking time and being with so that you get to know them and shape them. Well, anyway, here we see no Nathaniel listed. And Parker said, why, why is he called Bartholomew over here and Nathaniel over there. Actually, here, look, I want you to see something here with me. When, when Philip introduced Nathaniel to Jesus, notice how he called him. He called him, verse 45, Jesus of Nazareth, the bar of Yosef. Bar is the term that's used for son. So he was Jesus of Nazareth, the city that he was from, Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph, son. Joseph. If a little while later, I want you to notice that when 
Jesus, or excuse me, it's a little while earlier when Jesus was meeting Peter, verse 42, he said this, you are Simon, son of Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah. If you are looking at it a little bit more literally. Bartholomew is actually a surname for his family. Like Bar Joseph, like Bar John or Jonah. This is his surname. His family. Why did they call him by his last name kind of like thing? So there was Thomas' son. Thomas' son, Thomas' son, Thomas' son. I don't know. I don't know. Ask the Lord when you get there. That's how they knew him. However, when John talks about him, he refers to him as, well, his name means the gift of God. That's what Nathaniel means. As a matter of fact, my kids are kind of named, well, at least the boys, in line with this. There's a Nathaniel. You've probably met him once or twice. You know, he's hardly a guy you notice around. He's so quiet and meek, such a wallflower. You know, I do know him, and that's not it. Okay? And then there is John, who, guess who he's named after? And then there's Josh, Yeshua, Joshua in Hebrew, and you can see where Nathaniel, God's gift. How do you know me? That's what he came up with. One other piece of biographical data that I want to give to you about this Nathaniel Bartholomew. Nathaniel Bartholomew, about him, Nathaniel Bartholomew, huh, when I put that in, that fit over there, but for some reason it's not. Let's see if Canaan does that. That doesn't either. This says of Canaan. He was, John 21, 11, from the city of Canaan. That's where John 21, 11 says that he had grown up. So his name was Nathaniel Bartholomew of Canaan, like Jesus was called Jesus bar Joseph of Nazareth. And by the way, Canaan is exactly where Jesus is going. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Just a few hours from when Nathaniel and Jesus interact on the third day. Remember how this goes. The second day was the day that the disciples, Andrew and John, following Jesus, and on the third day, the next day, is when Philip and Nathanael picked up, and on that third day, chapter 2, verse 1, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and that's where Nathanael was from, and that's exactly where he's going, just hours from Nathanael meeting Jesus. He's headed right to his hometown. Now that's just some biographical data, so you know him. This is actually what I want to talk about, because this is what Jesus reveals about knowing you. Him knowing you. You knowing him, as a matter of fact, he doesn't know you unless you know him. Okay? But when he knows you, then... Your disposition, Nathaniel's disposition, your reposition, and your proposition that he lays out. That's what we see here. When Jesus knows you, there's an issue of disposition, there's an issue of reposition, there's an issue of proposition. Let's talk about this one, first of all. Disposition. I want you to pick it up because you get to know him by just kind of spending some time here with him. Notice this. John, or Philip, excuse me, finds Nathanael, and he said to him, verse 45, we found him, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, bar Joseph. Nathanael says to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? What is that? 
I want you to know what that is. That is attitude. That's what that is. That is attitude. Now, there is attitude that we all have. There is attitude that we pick up because of where we live. Do you know what they say about Americans? Attitude. They rule the world. Let me ask you this. Does America rule the world? Who rules the world? God rules the world. Jesus Christ will take control of the world. I'm not even sure the United States of America will exist when Jesus returns. Because our allegiance... Christianity does not equal the United States of America. Now, does that mean I am anti-country? Absolutely not, but I am this. Do not expect a pagan nation to act like Christians. It will not. It cannot. It is not able to submit to the law of God. That's the clear teaching of the scriptures. The light of the United States of America is the church acting like Christians. That is the light. America, America is not equal Christianity. Conservatism does not equal Christianity. Liberalism does not equal Christianity. As a matter of fact, the only time that I can think of the Bible tells you to be liberal is in giving. Does that mean I'm making liberalism? No, 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 I'm not. Because there are some benefits for us to hear from them. Attitude is what I'm referring to. Attitude. It comes to all of us. What was, the, what was this deal about the attitude? Listen to this. Nazareth was a rough town. Its culture was largely unrefined and uneducated. It's still much the same today. It is or it isn't a particularly picturesque place, although it is a nice setting on the slopes of the hill in Galilee. It's not a very memorable city and was even less memorable in Jesus' time. The Judeans looked down on the Galileans. The Judeans, well here, let me put up a picture here. Oops, excuse me. There it is. This is Galilee. Judea was down here where Jerusalem was. Up here was this district called Galilee. And there's Nazareth. It is about 10 to 12 miles apart, those two cities in Galilee. Now Nazareth was looked down upon by the Judeans. It was attitude that existed there. But even the Galileans looked down on the Nazarites. Okay? So here's this Judea looked down on all of Galilee, but in Galilee, even the Galileans looked down on Nazareth. It was like, What? What kind of a river rats? That's what we used to call some people from a competing town close to us. The river rats. Because they lived right on the Maumee River. So of course, the river rats. Nathaniel came from Galilee, which was even a more lowly village than was Nazareth, but he was simply echoing the Galileans' general contempt for the Nazarites. The same thing is regional pride here, he goes on to say. This is MacArthur, by the way. He says something like, Cleveland speaks with disdain of Buffalo. 
How about that? Hmm. Now, Nathaniel was from Galilee, which was even a smaller town, less picturesque than Nazareth, but he had copped an attitude. Attitude. You know, it is really beneficial for us to see that Jesus has people that God issues. Isn't it? Isn't that beneficial for us to see? Do you know anybody who's a believer who has issues? Do you live with anybody? I mean, like, even if I live alone, I live with somebody who has issues. And of course, the Lord cannot use anybody who has issues. They can never, never be a disciple. They can never be sent out to accomplish anything for Jesus' name on planet Earth if they've got issues, like attitude issues. Well, if you buy that, then you have an issue with Jesus because he chose these guys intentionally. And you know, this thing that Nathaniel had, it was some it, the whole Judean Galilee thing wasn't, but there were some issues that he had. You see, he copped this attitude from Micah 5, 2. says he just introduced him as being the Messiah. Talked about in the scriptures where the scriptures says the Messiah comes out of Bethlehem. What do you mean, scum city Nazareth? Can anything good, beneficial come out of Nazareth? That's... He's the son of Joseph, the carpenter. As a matter of fact, you know, when, when they disdained Jesus, when they put him down, it was attitude that he was the son of Joseph, a carpenter from Nazareth, a carpenter. As a matter of fact, they even called him a carpenter. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 3. Carpenter, Nazareth. Anything profitable ever come out of there? And I want you to know that there is a characteristic of God here. There is a characteristic of God. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn with it. This is a characteristic that he shows repeatedly. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians, of course, you know the Corinthians. They were such a noble group of folks, right? They were stellar in personality. I mean, they advertised their righteousness to attract people to their Christianity. Uh, no. The comment was that even the pagans in the world don't act as bad as what you've got going on in your church. That was the comment. And yet, I want you to know a characteristic of God here. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm just going to read this out because it speaks for itself. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers, as many as are in Christ. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is lowly and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God, and because of him, of God, are you in Christ, who became to us, Christ became to us, wisdom from God, righteousness from God, sanctification from God, and redemption from God, so that it is written, the one who boasts, let him take pride in this. It is God's work. It is God's work. You know, God has a kind of a 
characteristic choice of bringing Nazareth into play, of bringing a Canaanite on the picture, bringing things that just kind of like, what is that? I want you to do this. I want you to know that God is not pressed. He is not impressed by earthly human achievements that inflate the ego. He's not impressed. He is not impressed. When he knows you, he's impressed with something else. Characteristically, God. That's a revealing response. We got people with issues there. Here's another one. A disposition feature number two. This one is per Jesus. Notice what he says. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Now, as he was coming, Jesus saw Nathanael coming, verse 47. He saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Look at this. Wow. An Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Deception. That word deceit is a very interesting one. It comes from a private verb that means to put out a decoy. You know what a decoy is? A decoy, you kind of put out decoys when you're duck hunting so that the ducks will fly overhead and they'll see these fake wood ducks floating on the pond and they say, oh, hey, look, at there's some guys that are down there floating on that pond. That must be a good pond to float on. You know, I've taken duck psychology. That's why I know that. And so the other ducks kind of come down and they, so that, and they do so that you can, well, you know, you can't shoot a sitting duck. You know that? You're not supposed to, anyway. So that they'll fly down there, and when they're flying down, you can shoot them. Right? That's a decoy. To lure you in with something that isn't true. It's to lure you in with something that just isn't true. The word is a trick. That's what the intentional is. It's used figuratively of having a crafty deceit, of using some kind of subtility, some kind of sleight of the hand thing. God chose Israel for a purpose so that he can demonstrate to Israel what it is to have God in your life. That was the purpose of it. He says that. I chose you so that I might show you you're not like really impressive, but I did this so that you can show the world and God raised this world of Israel up as they went along with him. But as they didn't go along with him, Well, now when Jesus sees Nathanael coming, he says, now here is somebody in line with Israel. This is an Israelite indeed. And somebody who doesn't have this decoy stuff, this trickery going on. And Jesus said that when he saw him coming. and, and, And Nathanael says, how do you know me? What, what are you, you trying to con me? What, what, are, what are you doing? You don't, you don't know me. How do you know me? Isn't that interesting? I, I want you to know. There are some things that are around today. Oh, but when they're painted, they're painted. The Duggar. They're painted, and it looks like, that's it, man. That's it. But it's not what it is. Ashley Madison has kind of brought that out, too. Hasn't it. That's an it, not a she. Ashley Madison has kind of brought that out, too. What is this? What this is, is to say 
there are expressions of guile around. There are. A lot of times, it's a big show. And what do we do? I had a drug rep sitting across from me, talking with me about Duggar, Josh Duggar, and about Ashley Madison. What do you do? Oh, she said, and just this morning, a great evangelical leader fell. You know, this points out to us the Bible is true. Points out to us that. We have issues, but the Bible is true. Gives the ungodly opportunity to glory, but the Bible is still true. Because you who say such things do the same things yourself. The Bible is still true. You know, the great thing here, the great thing here is that Nathaniel, yep, he had some prejudice issues, but he was open minded. Look at this, verse 46. He asked, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. You check it out. And so he comes. Verse 47, Jesus sees him coming. And Jesus says those words. And, and Nathaniel's response, he doesn't say, you can't know me. You just met me. He says this, how is it that you know about me? How is it that you know me? How? How can you know me? Are you just trying to butter me up? How can you know me? Huh. You know, this thing about being open-minded, that is characteristic of Jesus knowing you. That you hear what he has to say. My sheep, finish this with me, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. You see what I mean? You see what I mean? I don't know where Duggar is, but I do know this that he doesn't, nor does the family, have righteousness in and of themselves. I do know that. Because the only righteousness any of us has is where? In Christ. That's it. And the pointing isn't to us. It's to him. That's the point. That's the point. It's pointing to him and our rescue. He was open-minded because the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. You know, this evangelical leader that this drug rep was telling me about on Tuesday, she didn't know his name. I said, well, who is it? And she didn't know his name. She, she searched it couldn't find it on her phone, and I said, well, I knew that last night, not today, that R.C. Sproul Jr. made a statement. Oh, that's who it was. That's who it was. R.C. Sproul Jr. And do you know how R.C. Sproul Jr. handled this? He took this by not saying, oh, I was looking into this so I critically could critique it. Oh, it wasn't so I could preach against it. Ashley Madison. He owned his sin, his issue. That is how Jesus' sheep respond. They hear his voice and they follow 
Does that mean R.C. Sproul is exonified? No, this is R.C. Sproul Jr. And no, he needs to step down. Needs to. I don't know. Needs to be brought along. Because it sure isn't the end of his life. It's not the end of his life. The Lord says when it's the end of his life. Not us. But he needs to be open-minded. You know, it's characteristic. It's characteristic. When he knows you, this is the way it is. This is the way it is that you are open-minded and you hear his voice. Look at this. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were serving those things which are nature, not God's, which are by nature, not God's. But now, after you've come to know God, or rather been know Him, and He goes on and He talks about us hearing His voice and how there is a competition in this, and we tend to turn back, but His Spirit is in us. Verses 6, 7. Never will this conflict go away. But you will progressively go forward. Step by step. That's how it is. It's not in us. Say this with me. It's not in us. What's not in us? Righteousness is not in us. Say this with me. Righteousness is not in us. It is imputed to us. You know what that means? That means it's judicially given to us by God. We don't earn it. We don't have it. And even when we think we're doing good, it's still like a filthy rag before Him. It's imputed to us. And so we hear His voice. And we follow. It's like we say, Lord, I know I am so destitute here that I need to go with you. Amen? I want you to know that is my only hope in counseling people. Because I am not going to drag out of them any righteousness. The only thing I hope for is that they hear God's voice, see their destitution, and decide to follow Him. That's our only hope. It is our only hope. And, And believe me, We don't have anything to offer beyond it. Nothing. So, Nathaniel has a disposition that is typical of an Israelite indeed. To hear his voice and to follow him. Forget the trickery. Oh, Disposition-wise, that's what we have. Jesus recognized it. Let's talk about reposition here. Because reposition does come into play. Reposition here. There's a revealing response that Nathaniel expresses here. Look what he says, beginning at verse 49. Jesus has told Nathaniel, verse 48, in response to, how did you know me? He says, Nathaniel, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree... I saw you. I saw you. And Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You are. You know, that is quite some... That is... The, he just met this guy. And remember, he was just saying just a little bit ago, how can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then he meets this guy. Jesus makes some statements to him that kind of like penetrate him. And he says, you are. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And by the way, I want you to know that we need to go a little beyond this. Not only is he the King of Israel, he is the King of Kings, the book of Revelation talks about. And not only is he Lord, he is Lord of Lords. That's what he is. That's what he is. And Nathaniel's response when just meeting him is identifying as being king and Lord. That is an amazing response. That is an amazing response. Obviously, he had some exposure to scriptures. And what happens here 
in what is said to him, the thoughts of his heart were revealed. I want you to know how this goes. You see, the fig tree, it was, it was kind of important to Israel. It, it, was, it was kind of like Christmas tree is. When, when Elite and I were first married, our first Christmas in seminary, Grace Seminary, we didn't buy a Christmas tree. We didn't have a Christmas tree. So she got out some ornaments, I think she made them, and decorated a rubber plant that we had in the basement, which is where we lived, in a basement apartment during seminary. It was a Christmas tree. Christmas, you know? I mean, what is Christmas without a Christmas tree? And Christmas tree. Well, fig tree was very important to Israel because the fig tree was kind of like an extension of their house. Houses were basically one room, okay? And they were kind of like, you know, you can't go to your bedroom. There was no bedroom. It was all just this one room. And they cooked in here, and they slept in here, and they, in here. This was it, okay? And they kept, because they cooked with open fire, I mean, they didn't go to the microwave, and beep, 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 None of that. They had to keep the fire going. So it's kind of like, do you know what it is to go into a room where there's fire? My wife has a kind of a respiratory issue with fires in the room. That was going all the time. All the time. Summer. All the time. So that was the nature of the house. One room with all that going on and a fire. And they they used to add on to their house by planting a fig tree close. Because the fig tree would grow up and it'd only get about 15 feet tall, but it would spread out 25 or 30 feet in regards to its branches. And it would throw a tremendous amount of shade so they would put these fig trees close to their house so they could go out on the veranda under the fig tree. And they could settle down under this shady fig tree where there wasn't the smoke and the congestion and all of that. And they would go there oftentimes to get some solitude, to get time to talk to the Lord, to get time to think. And when Nathaniel's coming, Jesus makes those comments, how do you know me? And he says, you know, when you were out there under the fig tree, all that was going on with you in your heart, I saw you. I saw you. Now you just met him. Thoughts of hearts revealed a repositioning that's understood. Look what he says. He said, you're the king, you're the Lord. That is a repositioning from where he was. He was saying, what good things come out of this run-down, unimportant, scummy place of Nazareth? A carpenter's son and a carpenter. (sighs) Repositioning. King of Israel. Son of Israel of God. I want you to know, when the Lord knows you, that is an understood thing. Jesus talks about it there in those two passages. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? That doesn't fit. The repositioning is you do what he says. He says in this one, Matthew 7, he says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Get this! Not everybody who says Jesus is Lord is going to heaven. This is the evidence that the person has a repositioning with him. But he who does what I say, he who makes him Lord, he who recognizes who Jesus is, these are the ones, and they will say to me, but didn't we 
Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we prophesy in your name? And didn't we do all this? And he says to them, depart from me, I never knew you. How does he know it? When you hear his voice and you follow. That is the characteristic of him knowing you. Do you have that? Do you have that? If you don't have that characteristic, there is no basis for you having confidence that you know him or that he knows you. And even though you've got issues, and even though you have competing affections and you fail, if you have that, be absolutely assured, he knows you. He knows you. If you have that. Final point. Repositioning, and now the proposition that's given to him. Two things here. Number one, there's an impressive response that Jesus has to what Nathaniel says. Look at this. Jesus said to him, verse 50, Because I say to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you trust me? You do? That is impressive. When Jesus pierces the heart, by the way, this is to be characteristic of the ministry of the word, that it pierces the heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about people coming into the fellowship and the word being expressed and it pierces their heart. The thoughts of their hearts are revealed and they say God is among you. You know, one of the things of preaching the word, and this is nothing on me, okay? This is all on the Lord. One of the things of preaching the word is that people get mad at you for talking about the issues in their life, okay? They say things like, what, do you follow me around? Who called you? How do you know this? Have you been going with me this week? I've had people look at me and say to me, why are you preaching that at me? Okay? I want you to know it's nothing on me, okay? It is on the ministry of the Word. That is what's happened to Nathaniel. It's pierced him. He has oppressive response, and Jesus says, because I pierced your heart here with this issue in the fig tree, you trust me? That's a good thing, but I'm going to improve on this. I'm going to improve on this. Here's the improvement. Look at what he says. You will see greater things than these. You, you, You will see these things. You believe that's how it starts and you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, this is a very important emphasis, truly, truly, I say to you, you see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God. There's something about being in the Word that it pierces like a sword to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's intentional. When you minister the word, that's what happens. That's intentional. And that happens. By the way, does that happen to you? Do you get around the Lord enough that he can speak to you through the word and you go, oh, 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 oh. That gets improved on. The improvements to your faith are coming, he says. What's the improvement? The improvement is that you take Jesus out to others and God makes a connection between heaven and earth through him. You get this? You have your own life changed. And you take to others Christ in such a way that heaven and earth get connected. There is ministry that goes. People's lives are touched in such a way that you go, Because it's Christ, the connection, and angels ministering there. 
This is an improvement. You're going to see it. As a matter of fact, he sees it right away and they go to the wedding of Canaan in Galilee. Right away, he begins to see it. I want you to know, the same thing happens for us if you're open to the Son. You see, opening to the Son as being the Lord, it's the way it is when He knows you. You're opening to Him like Nathaniel was. Question, on this list that you made, is Jesus on your best known list? Is he? Do you know him as one of the best? You say that was a trick. Okay, there is some guile in me. I got issues. Man, do I need Jesus. Jesus.